<laughs> Welcome, everybody. Welcome to our annual um, Educators Forum event here at, uh, at, at CTM. Just to explain my introduction, my name is Tom Cito, and I'm Professor Chair of Animation at, uh, at uh, USC. Um, this organization started a couple of years ago through the auspices of CIFA Hollywood. And, is, and, and we wanted to provide a, uh, a forum for the people who teach the art of animation to share ideas, get together and exchange thoughts and all. And so we, you know, we uh, have a presence online and then we occasionally have these uh, sort of uh, you know, uh, face to face meetings. And I always find it kind of fascinating because uh, you know, I always think it's interesting that, that, that animation professionals get together and they talk shop and whatever like that. And animation teachers hardly ever, you know, it's, it's, it's not really that, you know, and yet we're all teaching the same thing. So why can't we just get together and just, and just you know, ex exchange ideas and techniques and talk about what's going on, especially since the way our business is constantly evolving and how we've gone from a marginalized kind of art form. You know, I mean, when I started in the 70s, there was, you know, animation, and then there was grown-up movies. <laughs> was like real, you know. And now, like, you know, animation is, is all ubiquitous in, in the way we experience modern media. So, um, so this forum has been uh, has been a platform for people to just kind of uh, get together and and uh, talk shop. Yeah. So, uh, just by way, of, so we only have till ten forty-five. So I don't want to. Monopolize the thing. I know we have, have a room full of veteran talkers here. So, <laughs> what's great about this kind of meetings is that we've got animation educators here, literally from around the world. I mean, it's from Paris to Hawaii to Texas to wherever. I'm, I'm from Brooklyn originally. <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, and it is fascinating. Previous years, we've had educators from Scotland and Australia and Malaysia and. Taipei, and so it's it is very interesting to see the spread of people all teaching this this uh, curious you know medium we love so well. So just by way of introduction, um, my my esteemed colleague here, Lee Crow, is a is a uh, um, adjunct professor and a committee uh, member steering uh, steering committee member at Cal State Northridge and College of the Canyons. And um, uh, some, will some of the other committee members raise their hands? So, so, not, so, okay. so this is like sort of the, the, the uh, steering committee group. Um, we're very uh, happy to have as um, to have as our guest today is uh, Linda Selheim, who is a content manager for 3D animation uh, for uh, Lynda.com and LinkedIn Learning. Uh, uh, and Mr. Paul Husband, who is a well-known in the animation community as an entertainment attorney and uh, and a guru of all things legal, <laughs> well, to do with all us cartoon people, and uh, 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 Chuck Green, who is also a steering committee member and is professor of entertainment and art and uh, and the animation program at Cal State Fullerton. So, our uh, which good. Uh, Lee, let me turn it over to you, and uh, you want to start the conversation? Sure. Um, our primary focus, and correct me if I'm wrong, other steering committee members, is uh, that we primarily want to talk about faculty copyright issues, um, like uh, does the syllabus belong to the faculty member or to the school? Um, and then. Beyond that, we can definitely talk about student work, whether the school owns the student work or whether the student owns the student work. And um, then a lot of helpful hints um, we hope to share amongst ourselves about uh, teaching students about copyright. What's okay to use in the classroom? What's okay to use on their demo reel? What's okay to use in a lesson as long as you don't take it out of the classroom and let anybody else see it? Is that even okay? So on and so forth. Yeah, I think it's it, it's interesting that um, I know at USC we we usually we use a number of professors who uh, a lot of times do a lot of private lectures. You know, sort of like celebrities like Bruce Block and Leonard Maltin, and 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 some of them are very specific when when they're teaching that you're not allowed to record their 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 lectures, like they won't allow any recording uh, of, of their talks. And the issue comes up of your syllabus. You know, you know, uh, do you own your syllabus? Does the school own your syllabus? I know there's always like, um, uh, you know, um, 
universities that are in developing their own animation programs and all contact you all the time and they're like, can we see your syllabus? <laughs> Basically they want to copy it, you know, and use it, you know. But but just like what's the individual rights of the of the instructor, you know, to his own intellectual property? Which is a good question. Paul? Let me jump in on that one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but first, uh, let me tell you about uh, somebody who once said that they wanted a one-armed lawyer. And said, Why on earth would you want a one-armed lawyer? He said, well, you know, when I have a legal problem in my business, I call my lawyer, and I ask him the question, and he tells me the answer, and then he says, but on the other hand, <laughs> and, and that's when it starts to cost me money. <laughs> uh, so there is another hand. The, coming to the syllabi, a syllabus, uh, it can be affected by your contract with your university. Uh, but it, say there's no contract, or there's no written contract, and or that it's not addressed in your contract. I believe the better view is that it belongs to the professor. Uh, the basic rule in US copyright law is the creator is the owner of the work. Uh, and you own it as soon as you fix it in a tangible medium of expression. And you get federal statutory copyright when you fix it in a tangible medium of expression. Now, you get more rights if you register it. So if it's, some, if it's a serious work that you may do something with, it is worth registering with the uh, uh, Register of Copyright. Uh, and uh, you know what about the, the Writers Guild? That's okay, but it's not nearly as good. Uh, the Writers Guild lets you prove when you created it, but it doesn't give you additional rights. Registering it with the US Copyright Office does. It gives you the right to get statutory damages, it also gets you the right to recover your attorney's fees in an infringement action. But back a little bit. The, uh, is it a work for hire? The, the work for hire, that's a hot doctrine. Uh, and there are two, two ways you can get a work for hire. One way is if the creator uh, is an employee in the common law sense of uh, the person for whom the work or entity that for whom the work is being done. Um, and there's a, it's a 20-factor test, and actually in California, there's one test for the feds, the IRS, there's another test for the Franchise Tax Board, that's the state of California, and actually there's a third test uh, for the EDD uh, and the Educational Development Department. Their test is if, if the worker has uh, breath and uh, a heartbeat, uh, they're an employee. <laughs> uh, but uh, why does it make a difference? For a work for hire, you're either, if you're an employee, hired for the purpose of creating such works. If I hire Lee to paint for me, I, I want uh, six paintings, I want them all landscapes. And she says, yes, okay, I'll do that. And we have a written contract, and it has the magic words work for hire in it. Then I am the author for copyright purposes. Uh, and actually there's a difference. With the work for hire, the term is longer. You get either uh, 95 years from when the work is published or 120 years from when the work is first created, whichever is first. Um, the, um, anyway, with the work for hire, there are only certain types of works, nine, that it, it can, you can have it with. And I don't think that a syllabus fits. Here, here's the nine. Uh, note one, as a contribution to a collective work. Eh, no, I wouldn't say that. Um, as a part of a motion picture or other, other audiovisual works. Now, I don't know if you've uh, uh, released any of your syllabi, Tom, but uh, uh, anyway, that's one of the types of works that can do it. As a translation. No, not a translation. As a supplementary work. I don't think so. Uh, as a compilation, no, nah, that doesn't fit. Okay, here's where we get close. Uh, as an instructional text, well, the syllabus isn't the text. Uh, I mean, if, if you're putting together a text, uh, you might say, uh, Linda, how, uh, can you do a chapter on 3D online works and, and how they can be created? Well, if we have a, a written agreement and it says work for hire, then that could be. Uh, a, a work for hire, you know, because it, it's it's a part. But I, 
to me, a syllabus is it's a listing of what you're going to teach. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, that's the closest. Uh, and I haven't seen a case on it, but uh, as a test, is that a test? Nah. Uh, is it answer material for a test? Nope. Is it an atlas? Nope. So uh, the, the you can make an argument, and I would, but depending on who I'm representing, <laughs> uh, that a, a syllabus is not a work that is contemplated by the statute to possibly be uh, a work for hire. So uh, I would say that uh, it is the property of the educator, of the professor. Uh, and uh, if the university wants to vary that, well, you know what, Th that's something that can be, I think, uh, a subject of negotiation. Can, can, uh, I, can I jump in on this? Because sure. this is a matter of significant conversation at Cal State Fullerton right now and in the CSU system. And that issue of work for hire, that is how our contracts describe our contributions. And it's more than the syllabus. They're extending this to lesson plans, to online materials that are being presented. And this, the, the claim that's being made right now is that the university has 100% ownership and the creator has 100% ownership. And uh, it's, what you're reading right now is very interesting to me because this has been something that I'm, I'm the chairperson of the IT committee and because of the use of technologies today to basically capture your lesson plans in a video and put it online. Uh, in the past, uh, this idea, again, then the assumption has been the 100% ownership of both but it has almost never been enforced by the university. Apparently, now I'm, I don't know case law, but what I've been told is when it has gone to court, that the courts have ruled in favor of the university when a professor has tried to claim that they don't have ownership of, and this goes beyond the syllabus. The syllabus is a part of it, but this goes beyond it to lesson plans. And I know that there was a, you know, they've been doing video courses for decades which are kind of a precursor to this online content, which is a much more sophisticated and, and uh, flexible medium. But we had a, a video course or a course that had been put to video by the faculty person. And that faculty person, I think it passed away, but that course was being taught for like two decades with those materials. So yeah. this is an that, issue. That was my question because I taught online for a while. Um, it was more of a um, old school online with a forum type thing, but, but uh, and I'd love to hear Linda's comments on this too. Once you uh, film the course, uh, and, and current online teaching is not just, you know, some software recording you while you talk to the class, mm -hmm. they are elaborate online courses at some of the universities that are entirely um, produced. They are produced. And um, and that's in your list of things that says that it could be long to the university because it's produced. And the theory that you know the university put up the funds to make it gives them some kind of connection to it. So so with the growing mm -hmm. online uh, teaching of especially the digital end of the animation industry, how does that affect uh, ownership? teaching materials, which uh, in the past you used eventually to turn into a book to try to uh, at least promote yourself in your tenure, if not uh, make some money, since textbooks don't make much money. <laughs> okay, okay, excellent points. The uh, If it is put in an audiovisual work, that's different. That does put it into the category. Uh, uh, before going on, Professor Latell Herrick heads the program at Woodbury, and she's got a very enlightened uh, program, uh, an excellent program in my opinion, uh, w with the students vis-a-vis -vis the university. Uh, but uh, what you ought to do is negotiate. Uh, I mean, we, you know, if, if you're with Chuck, then you've got some clout, but uh, even individually, say, look, I, I want to own my work, but I tell you what I'll do. I will give you, the university, a license uh, to use the work and, and grant them a license that is big enough to accomplish all of their legitimate needs and interests. And it's fair for them to have something if they're, you know, if they're paying a salary, but it's also fair for you to be able to keep uh, the fruits of your labors. Uh, and so what I would argue uh, with the university is, look, 
it, it's my work. I, I don't want to give it to you. I'm willing to give you a license. You can use it. You can teach with it. But if I want to do a book or if I want to do an online course or if I want to do something, it, it's mine. And it, it does make a big difference, mm-hmm. uh, you know, whether you are the owner of the copyright. Well, the issue is eventually, can, can I just let me, let me get to Linda and I have to get, and then Joe wants to get in too. So. Well, I'll just, I can talk a little bit about our model and how we work. And it does say work for hire in the contract. I'm not going to get deep into the legal because it's not my job, but I do work with a lot of faculty, literally around the world, who do courses based on their syllabi for us. The lynda.com model, LinkedIn Learning, which is the same company now, we, um, we will work with a faculty to develop a course. And I don't know if many of you know, the lynda.com model is very different. We bring you into the studio. They are heavily produced. They're QA'd, everything. So it's different than we ship you a headphone, you go in your bathroom, record, send it to us, <laughs> YouTube. But um, we, we own the rights for the course in a sense, we own just exactly what that is. But most of, a lot of our teachers will use their courses that they do for us in the classroom, very much the flipped classroom model. We're adding assessments now, so it helps do a baseline for the teacher, particularly in the technical courses. And we really, it's very much the book model of publishing because that's how Linda Weinman started out. And we, in, you know, we encourage our teachers to, to use the content and to continue doing content. We like to build relationships. And, um, you know, if you continue to teach it in a course, that's fine. The only place we have a problem is if you did the exact same course for us with the exact same title, the exact same content and went to a competitor. But other than that, we're, we're very, very open. I actually find this really interesting because right now we're in discussions with the Board of Regents and um, I'm, I work at, uh, in the Nevada System of Higher Education and um, apparently it's going through all the schools because they, the Board of Regents is trying to put language and change the intellectual property um, policy so that they own everything. And like everything from your um, online course shells to like anything you write, create your lectures, um, all of your assignments, they're just trying to take everything and we don't know what's gonna happen. All of the um, faculty senates have basically said like, this is bull crap, please don't do this to us. Um, if you do that, we're just gonna pick a book and read from the book. Um, but like, what can we do to convince them that this is really not what I wanted to mention was that intellectual property issues are, uh, for us, becoming really relevant, relevant because of the online stuff, but they're not new. I mean, research scientists have been developing new technologies and patenting things and doing this in the university with university equipment. And so we've got policies at Cal State Fullerton that go back, you know, decades because of those issues, but they are specific. But those are specific to those. They yeah. aren't speaking to this online content. And because there's been in the past this assumption of 100% ownership, faculty are becoming more concerned. And that's why we're really looking very carefully at where we stand and trying to write a policy. Now, we are part of the CSU system, which is unionized. So we've got a CDA, which also speaks to some of these ideas. When we prepare a policy and what we try to do can't contravene law, obviously, or the CBA, but it may become really specific and it's maybe going to be different in your system or the private university that's not unionized. Well, currently, like <clears throat> our, the policy says that the faculty owns their course materials, so they're trying to change it so the university can take everything. Are you, are you guys unionized? No. Because I know, I think we have the same thing at USC about uh, about the, the professor retains his intellectual property, mm-hmm. but like the school regards the, uh, uh, you know, the university has the right to, you know, it it, it has copies of the syllabi and course, and, and all, but but they're they're pretty they're pretty um, uh, liberal when it comes to intellectual rights, you know, like. Like I say, you know, we have a teacher like Drew Casper, and uh, it teaches screenwriting. And Drew is very specific about you can't record me, you can't put any of my stuff online without my permission and all. And the school's okay with that. So, but I think it's on a case by case basis, not a general policy. And I wonder how what you said affects adjuncts who are actually not protected by yeah. the union. 
Well, they are in our system. Adjuncts are a part of the union, and so they are under the CBA. And when it comes to in-class recording, that's actually a separate issue. Um, and we do a policy specific to that. And then that can get mixed into people with disabilities who need some sort of accommodation. Yes, because that's a big issue. I've been asked many times whether yeah. a student can or cannot record. And we do have policies that speak exactly to that exception, but also give ultimate authority to the faculty person, but they need to make exceptions when people do have. But when a person does record under those conditions, it can only be used in the context of their need for the work for that class. So, but that actually does kind of slide a little bit off, at least in our university, away from this idea of who owns the work. So again, it's 100% ownership by both right now is the assumption, but that is of significant concern. And I am I'm kind of curious to see what your response is gonna be I, I to be those ideas. I, I'd be interested to read what gives 100% uh, ownership to the university, to, to, to both the professor and the university. Uh, yeah, I, I'm always interested in learning new things, but... Uh, two people who make a movie together have joint ownership and each of them can do what they want with it. So isn't it the same principle here? Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is, that's yeah. exactly right. That, yeah. That's the, the, the joint author doctrine uh, extended by what was, what was called the, the 12th Street Rag uh, doctrine. Uh, the 12th Street Rag, the music was written at one time in one place, much later by somebody who didn't even know composer of the music, the words were written, uh, are they joint authors? Yes. Uh, if it's a joint authorship situation, then that's true. Either joint author or any joint author, if there are you know, if all of us are joint authors, uh, any of us can exploit the work subject to just a duty to account uh, to our, our fellow joint owners. But, I mean, it's very good. Yeah, is that sort of like the equivalent of like that? Um, years ago, there was a there was a court case where like Benny Goodman took an old Yiddish uh, uh, song and, and, and modernized it and put lyrics on it. I think it's like you know, you know, I hear the angels singing, or something. and it was actually like an old klezmer song. And I think the 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 relatives of the family or something of the original of the originator of the melody like sued. And, 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 you know, it, but, but he had made it sort of a modern kind of like, a, you know, a swing tune. And so it, 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 is it sort of in the same area? Uh, a little bit. The question there would be, uh, was the tune in the public domain? Uh, mm -hmm. Was there still an existing copyright in the tune? Yeah. Uh, the, when Benny Goodman was alive, the Operative Copyright Act was the 1909 Copyright Act, mm -hmm. which is quite different than the 1976 Act, mm -hmm. um, which is what we have now. Evander, yes, just uh, more of a point of order. But another situation in specifically to France is that France, and, uh, a director or a creator, has also the moral right on something, which means that in the case of you saying Benny Goodman taking a tune, tune and putting lyrics or doing an, it means that the family could say, the descendants could say, no, you can't. We've got moral rights over it, therefore, you're not allowed to. Change the work. Oui, oui, c'est ça. Mais uh, les gens ici uh, n'aiment pas uh, le droit moral. Yes, I know. Uh, <laughs> and, I think uh, France is the only place which has um, moral, um, moral rights. <laughs> <laughs> Not really, but close, very close. Uh, the, 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 the legal concept of droit moral uh, originated in France. Actually, it's a part of the Berne Convention. Uh, and since the U.S. is a member of the Berne Convention, we're supposed to. Uh, honor moral rights, which we do a little bit. Hi, moral rights. <laughs> Bye, moral rights. I was thinking, as long as we're talking about the, this type of copyright, I, I, I was just curious. But what was the uh, what was the last uh, thinking about uh, about? Remember what uh, the copyright on Mickey Mouse with Walt Disney, where it was supposed to be fifty years from the death of the of the creator. So when we reached the fiftieth. That, you know, you know, of, of the death of Walt Disney, suddenly the Disney company swung into action and got the copyright extended. Yes, the, the, the Mickey Mouse Copyright Preservation Act. Well, that's what a lot of people called it. <laughs> Actually, uh, it, it. It really is real. That's I why uh, it, <laughs> it originally was uh, 50 years for work for hire. Now it is uh, the shorter of 120 years from when it's created or 95 years from when it's published. And uh, some people are gonna take a shot at that because in the, in the US Constitution, uh, it says copyright is for a limited time. 
Now the question is arisen with some, is 120 years a limited time? Uh, I think not, I'd make it shorter. Now this is my political prejudice, but I'll just tell you briefly. My political prejudice is we should give enough uh, protection so that original creators are compensated, but not so much that we deny the ability of these same creative people to use things that have gone before. You know, it's it's the the midget standing on the shoulders of the giant. Uh, anyway, so yeah, I know that we have a thing. I, I mean, one of my old uh, I'm at the school um, after after college at the Art Students League, and uh, one of our things was uh, we had a professor named Robert Beverly Hale, who was the um, uh, uh, successor to George Bridgman, and and uh, and he taught until his late eighties. I think he died in around nineteen eighty eight, but 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 before he died, he put all his lectures on 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 tape, like they recorded him, and the, and and the league now you know. Uh, distributes that, so he's he's dead and gone and everything. But his his lectures are still. You could look them up online and everything. Mm. So. That I think right there is what's making this such a significant concern today, mm. because whereas you as the individual house that special information, you're that faculty person, that intellectual property, if you want to call that, that you bring to the university and in the classroom can almost effectively be recorded and then used. Again, the sophistication of the technology we're using today, that's what's got people concerned. And I know that, and this is interesting, because at our university, which is governed by these, these contracts and stuff, but they put out grants, and in the grants, they wanted people to develop online content, but they wrote that the university would own it. And this put me and quite a few other people off from even applying for the grants, because it was like a couple thousand dollars. I'm like, I'm sorry, but it's not. That's that's far too low of an amount if you're going to own this piece independent completely of me, which is what they're effectively doing. And our university currently does have a clause in the intellectual property that says if they have provided excessive support or some, I forget the exact wording, then they are going to have ownership of what it is that you create. So... Again, this is, I think, that's why it's becoming such an issue today, and I think why it's worth talking about here, because this is, it's changing the way education and those materials are preserved and presented. There's, there's extensive piracy. I mean, we have a huge piracy program, so down to individuals doing things, we find our courses on Udemy and a lot of the other sites where people are allowed to just post, and what they'll do is they'll, they'll do a really quick front end and that looks like them, and then our course will be the whole back end. Mm -hmm. And so daily, mm -hmm. uh, my authors and instructors will be shooting emails to me and say, hey, I found this in Bulgarian site, I found this here <laughs> and there. And so, I mean, I think that permeates the whole yeah. system. I, I have heard of some universities uh, uh, when we were doing reviews that, uh, that in some, in some classes, the instructor will actually tell the students, go online and look up and, and this link and this link, and, and it'll explain Maya to you, or it'll explain Photoshop or something. So it's basically like, well, why am I going to this school if you're, gonna, if you're just going to tell me to go to a link, you know, which is kind of weird. We, I, what I think is a lot of the schools in our big enterprise academic area build courses in. I mean, we encourage faculty if they want to you know, do a course, but I know for a fact Full Sail and Art Center have actual courses that point to lynda.com, and a lot of that's very foundational training where, you know, it's it's 2017, I don't know that anybody needs to stand in front of a classroom and say, here's the move tool, you know, and it real, so real basic training like that. Yeah, CSUN is connected to Linda as well. Um, yeah, we are yeah. too, yeah, and so it, 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 it's it's encouraged the faculty use that tool and not spend the time in the classroom to do those things to get yeah, the concept. Baseline. Is there, there are questions? I'm just pointing to the Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, they won't. Everybody did. One of the things that we're encountering right now is that we have a lot of professors that will go online to social media like Facebook, create a group, and this is to allow students to post their work up, they'll critique it, they'll even post up tutorial videos as an answer. But because he actually included school's name as part of the group. The school tried to claim, say, uh, we won't control that content. And what he wound up doing was switching it to a private group. And under Facebook laws, that actually says that if it's a private group, then no one else can, you know, from the moderators can have control of it. So 
that was an interesting thing is that a lot of people now are creating, you know, not just online content, but in social media and such. Now, some of the schools are trying to like, well, because you're using our name or that because our students are associated with, we want to control the content or we want to own the content. That includes tutorials that it would create specifically for the students that answer a question. Well, I can, can I just share something personal that involves Linda and I? I I've been teaching Cal State Fullerton for some time and I create a curriculum and then she was with Autodesk and she contracted with me to effectively write my curriculum up that they then sold. So I kind of sold it to her. I didn't give anything to Fullerton. Is this is a recording? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> is this, this is being recorded? <laughs> that was like over 400 pages of material. You Never were way overboard. It was fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're kind of talking about the thing that, that gets to me. So you can, you can copyright original stuff, but there are knowledges that are general knowledge. How does anybody claim to own an understanding of the process of animation and, and where does the edge fall between Maya made this software but I'm the I'm the pro user teaching this software is it isn't this it's like how I, yeah I maybe can't put Woodbury stamps on my syllabus um, but if anybody owns my principles of animation class it's uh, Frank and Ollie you know because I'm teaching the 12 principles of animation how can the university claim to own any of this stuff. I can't claim to own it, so how can they claim to own it? I think that's a good question well, for well, a lawyer. You, you've asked two <laughs> questions. <laughs> <laughs> Very and, 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 and the, the two yeah. go in different directions. Let's do, go to the first one first. Uh, what you've described is, is the classical uh, idea versus expression dichotomy. No one can own the idea. No one can own uh, how you do a brush to get a certain effect. You can't own the, like, you know, Steve Willie was the first sound cartoon. It was, you know, you can't say I own that, you know. Well, but but mm -hmm. but you you can own your expression of it, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, maybe you you shouldn't own, you don't own uh, how to do a certain technique. But as you explain it, your expression of it that you own. So th that's the answer to that one. Uh, the ver when we get back to work for hire contract, basically, you know. Uh, You've got to wrestle. I mean, you're from a private school, so you're not going to get the power that Chuck's group would have. But yeah. but uh, uh, team up with Tom. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's it's a matter of uh, convincing your um, uh, powers that be yeah. in, in your university. Well, and, and, and all you need to do in a private university is have a change of president. Mm -hmm. And all your convincing goes out the door. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And so, actually, so the rights agreements I put in place when I started there are surviving because um, precedent. Precedent. Right now, they could stop on. They could stop having students sign them, and the students who did sign them would still be covered. That this is this is an ownership of student films. When I started at the university. Um, uh, research universities, not picking out any of them at the table, tend to already have IP ownership rights in place. And so they uh, view creative works as in the same way as research, and they own the creative works of the students. Now, most of those works aren't valuable, and they're usually pretty nice about it, and, and help them get into, um, but, but was Lucas's first film valuable? I don't know. Anyway, um, <laughs> so I came from UCLA idea, which was that the students owned the films. So when I got there, this guy who was my media lawyer when I was in the industry, um, helped me write a rights agreement, giving the students the rights to the work, clearly stated, and uh, but allowing um, uh, the university to market, to archive, and to um, uh, change, meaning make a clip reel. I have lots of things to do besides redoing student work. Um, so, so we have a rights agreement. I hand it to all incoming students over the age of 18 and say, here's your first contract. You're gonna see a lot of these, but at least I'm giving you the rights to your work. Most of the rest of them won't. Mm -hmm. So we start just right in the door with a rights agreement as they come into the school. And I, I kind of feel like now I should have been doing that with my faculty because the faculty use the server farm to work on their films. So we starting to, it, when I was in development 
at Warner's, I was pretty clear I would not even copy a script or a treatment that I didn't want Warner's to own on their Xerox machines. I didn't take it into the company. I didn't talk about it. It lived in my house, and that was it. Um, because I knew that my contract said if I did it. anything at Warner's, no, that, the one that I did at Warner's, they kept. Um, that if I didn't do anything at Warner's, you know, if I did anything at Warner's, my contract said they owned it. And, and I feel like there's a dichotomy in my business learning and my school learning and uh, the academy has a different approach to it, but um, but I personally would think twice at some universities about using university equipment to make my personal projects. It, it's an interesting pro uh, concept too. I was, I was curious about um, because um, I don't know what, what's CalArts policy about about student film because thinking about it, you know, Powerpuff Girls was a student film, it's a thesis film. Johnny Johnny Bravo and Dexter's Lab were were student films. They were thesis films that were later developed in TV series. So the, does the does Cal Arts didn't get a cut of that? Uh, yeah, I, know. I don't know. I don't know. For um, the race we have at Woodbury, so the students own their work. Does Woodbury have permission to use that work to promote the program? Well, that that's yeah. the point of the rights agreement. I mean, the reality so is the students own the work, and and a little paragraph in the in the catalog is not sufficient to override a student's copyright. They made the work. They own the work. With no no existing copyright agreement, then that's the truth. <clears throat> by by making a rights agreement, I gain rights to use their work on the use clips of their work on the website to market or pictures of their work in brochures. I I gain the right to show it in classes after they've left, but not for money. And I gain the right to um, archive copies of it because my accreditation requires it. So those are the three rights we hold back, and they're non-exclusive. They can do anything else they want with the film, but those are the rights we hold back. I attended a school and then worked at a school that had two different policies on that. Savannah College of Art and Design makes you, and I was in the illustration department, so it was all wet traditional media. Uh, they required you to put a sticker on the back of everything that you did that said it belonged to them. Wow. Yeah, so SCAD owns everything that their students do. Um, the Art Institute, on the other hand, um, asked for every teacher, now it was hard to enforce this, but we asked for every teacher to get every student to fill out a release saying that we could use their work in catalogs and we wouldn't get money off of their work. And it was completely their work, but there was no way we could ever use it in a catalog or even take a picture of it at a convention or anything like that without them filling out a fairly long release form. Yeah, we did that at, US, at Cal State Fullerton, but USC, I was a student there, and I'm sure Tom can give you that perspective from the other side, that they own everything we do, mm -hmm. but they also paid money. They yeah. have they budgets. They gave you a budget. You a budget. They yeah. gave us, and this was back when it was on film, and film and processing yeah, is expensive. Yeah. Okay. I think they give you a fairly good amount of yeah. money to yeah. produce all your films. Yeah. Yeah. And then, but then they own it, but they also would submit it to festivals. Yeah for you and they pay the fees so to me there was this reasonable exchange I guess yeah. I felt yeah. and you talk about Lucas I know THX 1138 was his first feature but that was also his 480 and his 310 I don't think USC that was claimed his Navy. and well there was the um, also Kevin Costner what's the name of the guy did Robin Hood his first film Fandango was his student film too I don't think USC does anything when they go into the big leagues they yeah. let that roll yeah yeah I think what the, what USC does is kind of like what Dory was saying was that was was that they reserve the right to to use it and to promote the program. You know, like they use images and everything to talk about the program. Uh, of course, you can get into the uh, the legal concept of fair usage, being that it's you know for educational purposes. As a, as a student, though, I just want to mention. I think where they drew the line was if the movie would make money. Like if it starts doing really good at festivals and there would be like money rewards or whatever, then USC was very interested in that and they wanted to handle that part. That, I yeah. don't know if you thought yeah. that's how my understanding as a student mm -hmm. was. Mm -hmm. So they promoted, they gave you a budget, but in a minute yeah. Yeah. it was lucrative. 
very yeah. stuffed in. Yeah, and they want to make sure that you got the the the, the, the school's bug at the you yes. know, on your credits. Yes, yeah. of course, for Always sure. You had to have that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. do we really only have until ten forty? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> you have five minutes. <laughs> so, I said so this I conversation was going to go fast. We <laughs> might open it to some of the people who haven't spoken up yet to see if anybody has any questions or comments. Yeah, does anybody does anybody ever want to ask something of an entertainment lawyer? Now's your chance. I remember the, the Sony contract said that they owned everything that you hadn't registered up to working there. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Anything you had not registered. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. I mean, when you work for Disney, that's right. outrageous. Yeah. 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 I, I would have objected to that. Yeah. 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 That's when scary. you work for Disney, it's like every bit of effluvia from your fingertips is owned by the Walt Disney Company yeah. forever and, and, and ever. Well, know. they had if that through the universe. If you blow your nose, they own that. Yeah. They own everything that comes out of Period. Something I've seen recently in just a couple of cases, and I don't know how it's going, but in master's programs, the school of partnering with indie game development, actually as a partner and looking for you know money to be made there. And I, I don't know about the legalities of it, but I thought it was kind of an interesting direction. Mm, yeah. Yes. I haven't seen it uh, in a while, but the one of the big concerns, of course, is the orphan laws. You know about people that are generating work, and then suddenly companies are picking it up. Like, uh, you know, even is getting graded all the time. You know, by you know the larger companies, you know, like Warner Brothers and Disney and such. Like, people are seeing their artwork popping up over in Disney stores and such. And Disney like saying, "Oh, we didn't know. We thought it was an abandoned work and such." And so that's the one of the things that you know. In other words, I know. Given probably about six months ago, I saw the orphan law was had raised its head again. I don't know if anyone has really talked about that since then. Mm -hmm. uh, I've not had any cases or matters that uh, point in that area, but uh, it doesn't surprise me. Because mm -hmm. yeah. it seems that right now companies, especially that can you know could find a word, publish it, but then say that, well, we did our due diligence, but we couldn't find who the original. Um, it actually happens were. a lot these days. It happens a lot. With, with, with clothing especially. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I should also put point out too, before we run out of time, that uh, one good thing to, to talk to your students about also is that, it, it is that if they've got a film that's running the festival circuits and all, be careful, uh, what you, uh, do some research on the festivals to find out if they're going to take the films and put them online. Because the because I'm a member of the Motion Picture Academy, and in the Motion Picture Academy, if your film is online, it, that's considered broadcast, and it disqualifies it from mm -hmm. any hope of an Oscar, you know, you, you know, any kind of competition, the student Oscars or anything. If you know, because there's some festivals that you know you you once you're accepted, they'll take your film and they'll put it online on their own website, and to the Academy, that's considered the equivalent of running it on television. Can I mention something in addition to that? There's some festivals that take the films and put them into compilations and put them on DVD or stuff like that too. So yeah. those, the, it even goes beyond that. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, so it's good to be aware of do the research, yeah. So I've been, I'm at uh, DigiPen uh, Institute, Institute of Technology and one of the things that is a big topic of concern is, you know, we do uh, animations as well as games and other kinds of things. And, and so the students are working on a game say, and there's a wide variety of uh, collaborators, uh, artists, programmers, game designers, what have you. And then, you know, the results of that project, who owns that? Now, currently, DigiPen claims that they own that. And um, in terms of um, the software uh, produced and, and the art assets that are produced and such, the, um, uh, the, the concept, there's a precedent where students have carried those um, and then uh, turn those into uh, uh, published games with a, with a studio. They start from the ground up again on, uh, on recreating that. Um, and there's clear commercial value in something like that. And there are uh, questions in terms of, of game engine uh, that was used, the software produced, and, and those types of things. But uh, it, for other things, you know, films, there's a lot less of a commercial value for, you know, a four-minute short film than there is, say, for uh, game concept or things. 
there are also things that are uh, where there are uh, physical media that are created that are unique media, uh, say um, uh, sculpture or other kinds of things that are that are uh, either the point of the creation or ancillary. Um, and again, there have been questions of you know who owns that specific work. And, you know, we're currently trying to uh, resolve that wide range of, of issues. It's a tough one. It goes a lot of different directions. <clears throat> I mean, my basic copyright lawyer instinct says, no, I, I want a work for hire agreement and or an assignment. Mm -hmm. Or you use, or the Fox method is you use both. Uh, you use work for hire language because that's better for you. And then if you know it's not going to be a work for hire anyway, and even if you don't, you put assignment language. The assignment language, you have the 40-year the termination of transfer. You don't get it forever. But uh, the, it's a very vital question. It's too big a one to answer in the time we have left. But it reminded me a little bit in a way, you say somebody who would do it again, uh, well, when they do it again, it's theirs. And that's sort of like Fogarty versus his aunts. Uh, John Fogarty, previous Clearwater Revival, uh, Saul Zantz, who's both a, a hero and a villain to me, um, and you know he he produced uh, Lord of the Rings. Uh, he also loaned uh, Fogarty money, secured by Fogarty's catalog, uh, in some bad tax shelters. The tax shelters went down. Uh, nobody got any money, but Fogarty sued, uh, or excuse me, Zantz sued Fogarty and foreclosed on his library. Okay, that's that's mean, but fair enough. But the horrible thing was. Fogarty started writing additional music to get, to get up on his feet again because he was like flattening his back. And Zantz sued Fogarty for infringing his own copyrights. <laughs> wow. Wow. Uh, uh, happily, uh, the end of the day was he lost. Uh, and, and for the first time, the U.S. Supreme Court authorized an award of attorney's fees against a plaintiff in a copyright infringement action uh, because the, uh, Fogarty's defense was, look, there are only three chords in all of swamp music, and what he called his music was swamp music. And of course, they're going to be similarly done. Uh, but uh, uh, that's a tough one. That, that's a, I mean, uh, we talked about that at greater length than other time. But mm -hmm. basically, everyone who's a creator, I think they've got to pitch in somehow. I was going to say, we're going to almost fall on the idea of co authoring, because you got people that do the assets, the story, the code. And it's all individual work contributing to one, and if it's not under contract or work for hire, it's basically it's like co-authoring in contribution. Yes, that's right. It would be a, a joint work, but if if it's Microsoft who's uh, trying to cling title to the joint work, if they don't have uh, any uh, piece of paper that says either I assign you my interests or I agree I'll work for you as a work for hire, they don't have the rights they need. Microsoft is not a joint author. Um, you know, Linda's a joint author, Tom's a joint author, Lee's a joint author, but not um, you know, the University of California or Southern California. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the bell has rung. <laughs> the period's over. I want to thank you all for coming, and thank you to Paul and, and Linda and Jeff for being our guests. Um, please sign your... Uh, your information on here, whatever, if you want to be uh, interested in future events. We usually do stuff at at, uh, at SIGGRAPH, and uh, we have a general membership meeting as well as CTN. Harvey, did you want to? Yes. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity. My name is Harvey Denner. I'm, I'm no longer a faculty member I'm a former one. You're an emeritus. <laughs> no, not even that, unfortunately. Um, the steering committee in its wisdom and with the support of CIFA Hollywood, I'd like to announce that we're going to have a first round of faculty grants mm, yeah. uh, to complement our student scholarships. And these are going to be a minimum of $5,000 to go around, probably $1,000 increments. And look for our website, which is on your sheet, says animationeducatorsforum.org and for all the rules. And this is available to both full-time and adjunct faculty. And it can be used for research purposes for helping create uh, works of art, 
I don't think we have any rights to them. <laughs> it's a free and clear thing. Um, and if you use things like going to a conference, it, it fits in with the schedule or something like that. Or hiring someone to uh, help you with a film or what, whatever it is that you need. And, uh, you know, details will be posted. Yeah, I'd like to say, too, that this is a trial run to see how it works. We uh, started out with a larger amount of money for um, students, so we give $30,000 worth of scholarships every year to students, so watch for that. And as soon as we get through this trial year run of faculty, we hope to expand the faculty grants as well. So um, in case you wonder where the money you pay to a SIFA goes, goes to the students and the teachers, as yeah. well as to the Annie Awards. And we feel that the uh, faculty awards are increasingly important at a time when a lot of schools are cutting back on giving grants. And if anyone's interested in more information about doing courses with us, grab my card. We will only own that expression of it. I learned today. Okay, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.